Hello, hello, welcome to Quackalope. Thank you for being here. Let's have a conversation about all the mistakes you're making. Or I'm making. Or let's have a conversation about all the mistakes experienced gamers are making. And I've ran out of uh, note cards at the moment, so I'm using just a sheet of paper to keep track of these main points. These are going to be the nine biggest mistakes that experienced gamers are making in our hobby. And if you're brand new to Quackalope, make sure you hit that subscribe button down below. Super glad to have you here. This is a follow-up on a video that I did a little while ago, the top five mistakes that beginner or new gamers are making. That one was received fairly well, and there was a lot of great ideas there. I also went to my Patreon community and asked quite a few of them uh, what mistakes they feel like they're currently making, or what mistakes they see experienced gamers making in our industry. So this list is compiled of some of my own thoughts, and then a lot of thoughts that came from the Patreon, the Discord, and from you, the community. So, let's start right up here at the top. You're still... You're still buying... You're still buying all the games. You're buying all the Kickstarters. You're buying all the new games that come out. You're still chasing that idea of a perfect game. But, this time, unlike the new gamer who has been romanced by the idea of all of these incredible games, this time you found ways to justify it for yourself. Meaning, you have studied, you've done your research, you are a expert in the board game space, and you're still buying everything. Both of those things can be equally true, and here's the reason why. You found the channels that match up with your taste in games, you can see the comparisons coming through, you love deck builders, and that means that Whenever a deck builder comes out, you, as an educated gamer, are going to find all the facts and information that justify your reason for purchasing this one, because this one will in fact be better than the other ones that you currently have on your shelf. Or, if you're anything like me, you love a good story, you love a good adventure, and so you'll find the artwork and the flavor text and the person who reads it just right on that main Kickstarter video to justify the reason why, out of all the games that you have that tell an incredible story, this one will tell a better story. The writing will be just slightly more sophisticated. In fact, you're an experienced gamer, which means you know publishers. You know how to follow publishers that put out the best games ever, the games that you love and adore, or you may have even gotten into the weeds, right? The developers, the designers, the writers, the artists. You buy every single thing that InnoTool is involved with. And that makes all of your decisions Maybe not correct, but at least justified. Here's the issue. There's so many new games that come out, and I do think that it is smart to be a more educated consumer base, but one of the mistakes that even experienced gamers still continue to make, new gamers buy games because they're excited. They're in love. But experienced gamers buy games because they're still looking for that perfect one. They're still hunting. The romance may be lessened or gone, or, or it might still be there. I mean, it certainly is for me when it comes to story and theme, but the act of justifying it is something new, uniquely new to you. You're able to do that. You're able to convince yourself that the mistakes of your uh, innocent years of board gaming certainly will not be the mistakes of your current, your present experience until two years later when those games start to arrive and you still realized you've backed, supported, uh, kick-started, uh, or just purchased in general, pre-ordered from publisher websites way, way too many games. I don't know that there is a good solution for this. I myself am still in this bubble, but I am, like you, much better at justifying my reasons. Rules checks. A mistake that I have made, probably from the point I was a new gamer all the way up till now, you don't check. When you think you have something incorrect or correct or there is a question during a game cycle, you don't pause to double check the rules because you are an experienced gamer. You don't need to. You've played this game half a dozen times. You've played this game probably two dozen times, potentially. Why would you, why would you not know all the rules by now? Or, you got this game to the table a year and a half ago. 
I mean, by this point, you know how deck builders work. You know how worker placement games, Euros, they're all the same in essence. And so why would we check the rulebook? Let's just go by instinct. Let's just gut check it and continue moving forward. Experienced gamers do this. You don't want to look. You don't want to doubt yourself. You move forward with confidence. And while I appreciate the drive and do the same thing myself, I have found that, especially due to posting content on the internet, I have to be way more aware of pausing and checking as often as possible or any time that there is a question about how something's resolved because my gut instinct, my gut check is so, so wrong more often than I would like to admit. You, uh, you win board games. No, I mean, yeah, you're an experienced gamer. Of course you win board games. You win a lot of board games. Here's the problem. You win board games that you teach. Mm, there's the issue. If you really are a good teacher, if you really are good at planning and prepping and bringing a game to the table, showing your friends, introducing this wonderful world of board gaming to them, and yet you still win, there's probably a little bit of an issue there. In fact, I see it as a sign of great accomplishment when my friends are able to be competitive and win a game that they just played for the very first time without me holding back at all. I want the game to be rich and inviting, and if it's a struggle and I still win at the end, I kind of feel like I had a slight advantage just from knowing, just from being the teacher. How could have I done a better job to get them into a, a position where they could be competitive, where that first game could end with a uh, dramatic or an upsetting victory? Now, of course, it's not a problem if you win some of the games you teach, but if you find that you're winning all of them, you might need to examine your criteria. So, you win games, but you win games that you teach. Now, following up with that, there's another issue that we should probably bring up. Why aren't you developing a teaching plan yet? Especially when you're trying to bring these more advanced, heavy games to the table, the games that you want to play because you're an experienced gamer, but... But your new friends, your, your game group, probably don't play games as often as you. Or even if they do, you're still bringing games that take 45 minutes or 30 minutes to teach just for the rules. And even by that point, you will, will not have gone over every little minutia in detail. I mean, I'm looking at Feudum on the table behind me. If the person who introduced me to that game had not had a plan to teach it to me, my experience would have been vastly different. So, why aren't you still developing teaching plans? It's probably something you thought about a little bit towards the mid, you know, point of your board game career, really prepping and preparing when friends were coming over because you were in love with games, you immediately opened them up, read the rule book, and thought about how you could get people to play them with you. But now, as an experienced gamer, you've decided that you're good enough at games, good enough at teaching, good enough at the rules that you can just move forward confidently. And when I say you, I'm definitely talking about myself. Take the time to sit down and script a little bit. Think about the best method to teach people the game. Shut up and sit down, have an excellent video on how to teach board games. And you should really prep a little bit more than you probably do at the moment, especially when you're getting a heavier game to the table. Now, along with that, you underestimate the heaviness of games. You think, I've played TI 16 times, I know this one inside and out, there's no way my friends will have a problem with it. Or Gloomhaven, or Kingdom Death, or, you know, Pipeline, any of these games that have a little bit more weight than your average board game. You can't do that. If you're bringing someone into this hobby, if you're introducing them into this space, you need to be prepared to get them in the door as quickly and efficiently and give them the best experience possible. And your idea of what a midweight game is, you might need to gut check just a little bit. Think back a year or two years ago or 15 years ago when you first started playing, what was 
a midweight game? What was a heavy game? What was a game that was a little bit more than you could chew? If you're bringing someone to the table, don't go based off of your personal standards. Go maybe off of maybe a wider array, a community leveling system, or what you know about your relationships. I think experienced gamers have a tendency to underestimate the degree to which a game can create AP, can uh, create brain churn that just is not fun to play in. Now along with that, the classics. You not only underestimate how heavy some games are, but you've devalued the idea of some of the games that got you into the hobby in the first place. Are you still ready and willing to play Catan or Ticket to Ride, or do you scorn your nose at games like Monopoly or Clue? I mean, sure, there's some complaints to be made. I mean, the roll-to-move mechanic is something that probably hasn't been utilized in the current age of board gaming for some time, but those games are still how people arrived here. And in a lot of ways, those games are still how people arrive here. So don't scorn them. Don't snub your nose at them. And don't forget about where you came from. I grew up playing head and foot spoons, loving the heck out of Risk. And Catan and Ticket to Ride were where I entered this hobby when it comes to family games. Where I discovered that there was something bigger beyond kind of the, uh, the sphere of board gaming that I was familiar with. So, as an experienced gamer, celebrate when people discover new games. When they enter the hobby, be willing to sit down and play. If someone brings over Ticket to Ride, and it, they are so excited that they just discovered it, and they know you're a board gamer, and so they want to play it with you, do it. And enjoy it. Double down on that experience. You can't... My phone is ringing. I'm going to make sure that you can't hear that. Oh, get out of here, phone. <laughs> William Lipcott, someone who uh, helped me come up with this list, you not only helped script this list, but now you've interrupted the video, and I will make sure you watch this, because this is one of these conversational videos where, for some reason, I, I, I don't do a lot of cuts, but I do, I do drop my pen. We were just talking about how when someone comes over to your house, and they enjoy a game, you should sit down and play it with them. And you should enjoy playing it with them. I mean, the reality of the situation is they are new to this hobby. And if they show up with Catan or Ticket to Ride and you say, ugh, or Splendor, and you pull out three other games that do that mechanic better, you very well may lose a new gaming buddy. And you very well may lose the opportunity to bring them into our space. So, keep that in mind. Don't stub your nose at the classics. You also, when you're teaching games, when you're playing games with brand new players, you need to be careful that you don't mother duck them the entire time. Now, what does that mean? That means you bring them under your wing and you say, oh, there's a strategy here that you could follow. Oh, you might be overlooking this. If you have that card in your hand, then you might be able to do this chain of events. You end up playing a solo game where you're controlling three or four players' hands of cards and where they're placing their meeples and workers and the actions they're taking. Don't take control. Now, it doesn't hurt to provide opportunity, to provide some suggestions, especially early on in the teach, early on in the game. Make sure that they're not missing something major that could end up with uh, an upsetting or an unrewarding gameplay experience. For instance, I like pointing out when a opportunity where if they miss it, it would, adva it would advantage me. I like pointing that out to players because... If I'm aware of it and maybe they're overlooking it, I don't want to take advantage of something that really ruins the game for them. But I also don't want to just not do it if it's a good strategy on my part. So I might point out, like, hey, if you move your meeple there, there's a chance that I can come in and take your roost because it's completely open. And they might be like, oh, thank you so much. I didn't realize that. But that's it. That'd be the limit of the suggestion. And after you get past that early game point, those suggestions slow down and stop almost altogether. Be very careful 
of bringing other players under your wing to the point where you're playing the game for them. Finally, the last, uh, the last two points we have. Experienced players, at a certain point, stop exploring the hobby in the same way that you did with Wide-Eyed Wonder when you were a new gamer. Meaning, you snub games for ratings or for boxes or for art or for flavor text. You stop looking for new mechanics and systems that you might enjoy. You assume that the game that's coming out or the game that already existed is nowhere near the games that you've already discovered, and so you're perfectly content and happy with your collection. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. If you have a collection that you love to play, stick to it. I'm excited for you. If you have no interest in exploring the space, that's all right. You don't have to. As long as you're getting games to the table and you're enjoying this world that you live in. But there is an element of that discovery process that I think as experienced gamers, we run the risk of losing. And so if you, like me, entered the hobby with this wide-eyed wonder, this idea of how incredible games could be, the promise that they made, don't be scared to still continue to explore that element. Whether it's buying old games that you've heard great reviews of, whether it's getting new games to the table more often, whether it's being willing to play games that other people bring to your house, you get comfortable with the games that you know, the ones that you always play, and you run the risk of missing out on some real gems that exist in our hobby. Over the last 20 years or so, the innovation and design and the ways that board games have iterated on this space has been absolutely remarkable. And so, as an experienced gamer, don't lose that starstruck wonder. Now, I know, contradicts a little bit, right? I'm not telling you to go back everything again. I'm not even telling you to justify everything you back. But I'm telling you to be open to playing. Open to enjoying a game. Open to exactly what this space is. To sitting around the table and spending quality time with friends and family. Or sitting on TTS and spending quality time with people from all around the world. Link to the Discord down below if you'd like to come join. We have 300, 3,000 some members. Uh, and games happen nearly every single day. And finally, experienced gamers. You get too stuck up on reviews on number ratings and rankings and position when it comes to BGG and how many other people like a game, to the point where I'd argue your own personal tastes are likely swayed by the industry as a collective more than your own personal experience with a game. How many times have you played something and thought you enjoyed it until you checked that it was a 6.5 on BGG and started really reevaluating why you probably should not have enjoyed that game? How many times have you played a game and just not liked it until you checked BGG and saw that it was an 8.0 and now you're questioning yourself. Why does the rest of the industry love this game that I just couldn't connect with? Don't put so much weight on those systems. Don't worry about it as much. They are interesting comparison models. It is fascinating to see where other people align with your tastes and it can be helpful to gauge what games you want to try and check out, but... The reality is, I have some games that are 6s and 7s on BGG that I'd absolutely love to get to the table more. And I have some games that are 8s that or 7.5s that I'm okay. Just like the dogs barking outside, I'm alright not playing them. I'll scare them away with uh, you know loud Great Pyrenees barks. I only say that because if you're hearing, you know... In the, in the background of your headphones, a giant white Great Pyrenees barking and you're wondering where it's coming from. Well, it's coming from here. All that being said, those are gonna be the nine biggest mistakes that experienced gamers make. What did I miss? How many things do you line up with? And what iterations on this series would you like to see us cover? We've done beginner gamers, we've done experienced gamers. Where else can we go from here? Whatever the case, whatever you do, remember to do the important thing, get out and play some games, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.